How's it going everybody? So in this video, we're going to be talking about nutrient deficiencies and why you don't see me making a whole lot of videos talking about nutrient deficiencies these days. You don't see me making videos like the top 10 most common nutrient deficiencies, the top 10 vitamin deficiencies that can cause suppression or any craziness like that. And whenever I talk about nutrition for health or disease reversal or prevention or you know how to optimize your energy levels you never really see me talking about um, vitamin or mineral deficiencies okay there's a really good reason for it you all have to understand I have been in this game for over 10 years now okay since 2012 and when I first started the first thing that I was looking for was overcoming nutrient deficiencies. I was looking for all the, 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 the vitamins I could be deficient in. Uh, one of my first videos, it actually, it actually blew up. It was me telling people that I solve my anxiety by taking a B vitamin complex and some magnesium. Magnesium oxide, mind you. Like the worst form of magnesium. And I didn't realize it at the time, but it was actually a, a placebo effect um, that I had found out later on. <laughs> and people don't understand anxiety is one of the biggest, biggest things that can be that can be susceptible to placebo and nocebo. Um, and I've made videos about how I conquered my chronic panic disorder over and over again. But uh, anyway, so anyway, yeah, um, I had made hundreds of videos talking about B vitamin deficiencies, uh, multi, uh, what, what the best multivitamin was in my opinion, and all this other shit. Uh, talking about calcium metabolism, vitamin D metabolism, uh, you name it. Okay. I probably made at least 20 videos on magnesium, different forms of magnesium, all of this. Okay. Uh, it's not that I am uninformed, okay? The biggest problem that I see these days in uh, nutrition communities and, and, and supplement video people and nutrition science communities and stuff is like, so first of all, okay, I don't know if y'all have ever seen that meme where um, it's like an IQ scale, <laughs> And in the middle of, IQ, of the IQ scale is like the, the mainstream consensus. At the beginning of, of the IQ, at the lower end of the IQ is like the simple answer. In the middle, it's like the complicated, crazy answer, which is usually the mainstream. And then the, the on the highest IQ peak on, on this meme, it's the simple answer again that the person with the lowest IQ has. So this is actually how I feel about a lot of these things. Um. The mainstream consensus on most topics, especially vitamin and mineral deficiencies, is extremely reductionist and overcomplicated, and it guides people towards all the wrong paths. Okay, uh, but when you go come over the hump after you so after you have really dug deep into the research and the reductionist mechanistic data and all this other stuff, you come out the other side and realize that it was a waste of time, <laughs> like, well, you know, for the most part, and that most people are just binging on information. They're addicted to learning more technical, mechanistical information because it gives them the illusion that they're getting closer to understanding the truth or facts or whatever. And, and really, all it really is is mental masturbation, okay? Um, Learning about, you know, how like uh, if you, you, you know, uh, mega dose vitamin B6 or whatever, you could like uh, create more dopamine receptors and this and that, um, lower your prolactin levels and blah, blah, blah. Um, the vast majority of that uh, outside of short term, like kind of nootropic stacks and stuff like that, the vast majority of that usually actually makes people even worse off. Um, the reductionist kind of mentality surrounding these things usually results in expensive urine, lots of money invested into experiments that nine times out of 10 don't play out the way people want it to. People are constantly chasing this like 
peak, this what I call the nirvana of health that doesn't actually exist. Uh, anyway, so let's kind of like explain why vitamin and mineral deficiencies are not something you should focus too much on, provided you have the fundamentals down. The first thing, read the book by Catherine Price. It's called Vitamania. Okay, so this book goes into detail about how um, the most kind of prevalent vitamin and uh, deficiencies were first discovered, okay? The history of vitamin deficiencies, the history of um, vitamin supplements, okay? And, 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 and uh, um, epidemics of vitamin deficiencies and then how they were solved and then the vitamin supplements that kind of uh, came as a result of discovering these deficiencies. And then it talks a lot about how giant food companies started to market these vitamins as um, these like super elixirs, right? If you all can think about the ginseng buzz, the ginseng craze, and then as of recent, like the medicinal mushroom kind of buzz, which you know, I, I'm not, I'm not saying is right or wrong. I'm all about the ginseng and stuff, but, uh, these things kind of came up, um, as these like panaceas basically. And, uh, there were cereal companies, candy bar companies. There were freaking soda companies that came out with vitamin and mineral enriched, um, sodas and they marketed it as a health food. Uh, so I think the the cereal that came out, it was called like King Vitamin or something like that. I'm sure you all have heard of that and know what I'm talking about. Um, but there were candy bars that were marketed as health foods. And I, I'm not, I don't want to make too many claims here, but uh, I'm sure most of you all watching my channel are familiar with, um, you know, sugar-coated cereal that has the American Heart Associ Association label on it. Um, margarines and fake, uh, fake oil spreads that have the American Heart Association label on it. Y'all have to understand that these big food companies were, uh, brainwashing the public. Okay. In the, in the mid like 1900s, like 19, was it 1960s, I believe was when it was really prevalent. Um, around the same time that these junk oils, um, margarines, vegetable oil spreads, all this stuff was being marketed as a health food um, and, and, and pushed as like the, the savior to heart disease and stuff. Um, these big food companies, okay, capitalized on, on it, made the public think that vitamin and mineral supplements is what they needed and that you could make a freaking junk food a complete like t uh, health elixir if you just uh, added a bunch of like refined isolated uh, vitamins to it and then of course the the health association got behind it until eventually the fda had to crack down on it or or, or whatever but read you read that book like most of the answers people really need are found by reading these books that I always recommend. And then of course, going through trial and error and refining the process. The problem is most people, I don't know what the hell is wrong with people. I always recommend like a list of books. I will literally teach them everything that they need to know to prevent themselves from being bamboozled by bullshit. And then also to give them the tools that they need to feel their healthiest and to navigate like what's real, what's fact and what's not. But no one ever reads these fucking books. Very few people do, okay? And the ones that do suddenly reverse all their health problems. Anyway, like most people can't even go a whole month through an elimination diet <laughs> to figure out if, it, if that was a solution for their health problem or not. I, I, I don't know, whatever. I'm just going to make this video and stop ranting. But uh, <laughs> yeah, read the book fucking Vitamania by Catherine Price, please, okay? So, yeah, first of all, the, the whole kind of fascination with vitamin supplements came from this kind of marketing craze that was pushed after the very first couple of vitamin deficiencies came about in the population, okay? Next that we have to consider, we, we never had epidemics of vitamin deficiencies, okay, um, until the refining of foods. Now, 
it's very important that you understand there's a huge difference between famine or starvation and vitamin deficiencies. There's a huge, huge difference, okay? A famine is an overall deficiency in food intake, okay? Let's just say that, or energy intake, okay? But for the sake of this conversation, we're going to say from whole foods, okay? Um, Vitamin deficiencies is when your body, for whatever reason, is depleted of a specific nutrient that it needs for enzymatic functions, uh, neurotransmitter functions, to create energy um, and and metabolize things like uh, glucose and ATP, um, and to form new, you know, proteins or whatever in the body, and the list goes on. Um, your body's missing an element, okay, for whatever reason. It's depleted. It's depleted. Keyword depleted of a, of a nutrient that it needs to synthesize energy or what have you, okay, that it needs to, to, to function properly, okay? So famine, little to no food. Vitamin deficiency, like you're eating plenty of food, but you're lacking something that the body needs to function optimally, Okay, that eventually creates a, a, a significant noticeable deficiency syndrome or disease state. Okay, so here is the thing. Okay, before the refining of foods, you had famine, but you didn't have the type of vitamin deficiencies that came about in the like 1800s and, and early 1900s. Okay. Maybe there were some cases and stuff like that, isolated and, and stuff, but it was never fully kind of like written about and, and brought to the forefront until the late 1800s, early 1900s, really till the refining of foods, you know, until refined sugar was like a, a, um, a, a big part of the diet and um, refined rice and stuff like that was as well. So really, it was uh, vitamin B1 deficiency and beriberi that was brought to prominence. Um, I don't want to tell you, like, if you read the freaking book I'm recommending, you'll find it, okay? You'll, you'll, you'll read all about it. But basically, um, the uh, beriberi epidemic or whatever, vitamin B1 deficiency, um, there were a bunch of uh, Japanese sailors that were basically paid for their military duties in white rice because at the time it was only the royal people like the kings and queens and emperors that were able to consume the white rice white rice was seen as like a king food a luxury which is crazy knowing what we know now that it's like the worst you know it's like deprived of nutrition or whatever but so the sailors viewed okay and remember (laughs) Uh, value is subjective. That's a, a philosophical insight you should take away from this, okay? Um, but they were paid in white rice because that was seen as like gold, basically. Um, so the Japanese sailors, they were paid in white rice. And, um, you know, several weeks uh, passed or whatever where the majority of their diet was white rice. And they were eating other things and stuff too, but the majority of their diet was white rice. And eventually they developed uh, what we now know as vitamin B1 deficiency. Now, of course, it took years before they figured out exactly what was killing off these sailors, okay? It wasn't some simple shit like, oh, I have brain fog, I have low energy. Like a lot of people, uh, when they look for vitamin deficiency symptoms and and they try to supplement, they just have some basic um, problems that could be solved if they just ate a, a good freaking diet and took some adaptogenic herbs. Um, these people were dying. They literally were wasting away and dying. They had like deadly, dangerous symptoms of B1 deficiency. Chances are they had other, th- other deficiencies too, right? Because they were eating like such a deprived diet. Anyway, eventually um, after the researcher that found, that, that found out it was a B1 deficiency, after he died... Finally, the, the mainstream science community came to the, realiza- the realization that he was correct. But it's only after he died that he got the respect he deserved. He was seen as a quack in the mainstream throughout that entire time. Okay, and this is another point that I am trying to that, that is important to take away. And it's crazy people can read these things and not understand how common these things are these days. Is that 
Um, just because something is seen as like the mainstream paradigm does not mean that it's correct. Okay. And the whole scientific community can all agree on, on something and then be completely wrong, found to be completely wrong. Like the opposite could be true decades later. Okay. Um, and it's just important not to be emotionally attached to any one paradigm. Um, so anyway, yeah. Okay. So this, this was the beginning of why we now fortify white rice, white, uh, you know, like refined rice, refined wheat and all this stuff with B1. Okay. And then of course, later on, we discovered that there were several other, def uh, nutrients that are depleted, um, from the processing of these grains and sugars and stuff as well as um, deficient in people who eat those as a primary source of nutrition. So now the government or the FDA or whatever have purposely, okay, they have like, or the USDA, whatever, okay, they, they have made it mandatory that these food manufacturers fortify, okay? Remember, there's a difference between fortification and what's the other word? Whatever, I forgot the other word, but there's fortification. There's another kind of word for adding nutrients into a food. There is a reason why they fortify these things with vitamins and minerals, okay? Um, it is because populations of people start to die off from nutrient deficiencies when they eat these refined foods that are that don't have those vitamins and minerals added back in, okay? So, so just for reference, some of the things that are added to these refined foods, uh, B1, B3, you know, niacin, um, iron, just to name a few. Okay. But there's usually a whole slew of other things. Now, an interesting thing you, you should think about is when you refine wheat and rice and stuff like that, there is a lot more than just the, the B1 and the, and the iron and the things that are fortified in it that are taken out. You should really ask yourself, why is it these vitamins and minerals that are the most important to be fortified, okay, in these refined foods? Why, why, why not the magnesium and, and, and the calcium and all the other stuff? So this is where I'm getting at. This is where I'm getting to with my point is that um, vitamin and mineral deficiencies, mo more specifically vitamin deficiencies, okay, as we know them. It from a like clinical standpoint, where where it's it's a fact that you have it and you're and you're basically dying, okay, from a depletion of a nutrient. They did not exist as we know them now until the refining of foods, okay. And keep in mind, refined white sugar is not fortified, and I think it's because there's a misconception about um, the role of these vitamins and why vitamin, like how vitamin deficiency is created, okay? I mean, I've talked about this so many times before. So um, here's what I'm getting at is that I don't think that there is, an, there is a, a, a standard number of each vitamin and mineral that you need to eat every single day in order to prevent deficiency or be healthy. This is very important that we understand this, that you fully understand what I'm talking about here. I encourage you to ask me questions in the comments to explain this further, okay? I used to think that this was quackery, and, okay, until I actually tried to get the recommended daily intake of all nutrients on my chronometer, okay? Here's the thing. When, what are the B vitamins needed for, especially B1? B1 and these other, they're, they're required for the metabolism of certain macronutrients, okay? So we know that um, glucose and carbohydrates require B1, B3, and other, new, and other vitamins to metabolize them into energy. In order to take those refined carbohydrates, okay, or just carbohydrates in general from the food and create usable energy from them, your body needs 
these cofactors, these vitamins and minerals to convert them into energy, okay, to kind of like continue down the cascade of, um, of producing energy from them, okay? And so what happens if you don't have these vitamins or these minerals? Well, there's a lot of potential things that can happen, and I would wager that we don't actually know for sure, for sure, uh, despite the fact that a lot of people will in, um, convince you otherwise. <laughs> uh, but it seems like nutrient deficiency is what happens when your body is still trying to metabolize energy from these 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 uh, macronutrients, like let's just say white rice, but it doesn't have... It's not being like the, it's, it, it needs to take those vitamins away from somewhere else, like from your lips, from the stores in the liver or somewhere else. And if it, if the food you're eating does not come packaged with these vitamins or these minerals or whatever else, then it has to pull it from somewhere else. And eventually your body runs out of whatever the backup is. And, and it could be the case that it's not even B1 or anything. Cause we think of these as like water soluble okay so we think that we have to always have a supply of b1 because it's only soluble in water but you know or vitamin c or these other things that you know they think that it can't be stored it's only water soluble but for one there's a lot of other kind of potential replacements the body might be able to create or gather from and uh there are places where the body can or does store some of these things and can pull it out um Anyway, I don't want to get too much into reductionism here. What I'm trying to get at is a lot of these, the, the deficiency syndrome thing, things that we think of is context dependent, okay? It's, it's, not, it's not the standard thing where, you know, I eat a, let, let's just say, um, let's just say little Jimmy over there, Jimmy eats a ketogenic diet consisting of, of uh, mostly meat and broccoli, okay? No carbs or anything like that. But Samantha over there eats like a, like a, a Asian diet consisting of mostly rice, vegetables, and a little bit of meat here and there, okay? Samantha eating the high-carb rice diet or whatever um, is going to, is going to be using a completely different profile of vitamins and nutrients than Timmy eating the mostly meat and broccoli diet. Okay. The composition of your diet changes the amount and the dosage of different vitamins and minerals that you need, as well as the composition and the individual nutrients that are even required to begin with. For me, I have, come to a kind of, I don't know, place where I feel like, for example, vitamin E, vitamin E, okay? Is it, first of all, is it an antioxidant? And if it is, how does it provide its kind of uh, antioxidant properties? And under what conditions? I feel like vitamin E is mostly uh, beneficial or, or highly essential per se, within the kind of like context of uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids and, and the fat composition of your diet, okay? Um, I think there's a reason why vitamin E is found in certain places in certain doses and not found in others, okay? The idea that you just need, vi you need vitamin E and you need the, the RDI set by some like kind of, it's like an arbitrary limit set by like the government and all these other places. It's not arbitrary, but it's like, there's not a lot of evidence backing it. It's a standardized number that they're hoping can provide benefit to the widest, most general variety of human populations possible, okay? It is crazy how many hoops you've got to kind of jump through in order to get all of the recommended RDIs of nu nutrients in the right forms and in, in, in the right forms like vitamin A, um, vitamin A, the, the different forms of vitamin K, okay, which the government doesn't even recommend or doesn't even recognize vitamin K2 as its own unique kind of thing, <laughs> so which is interesting because they're very different from vitamin K1. 
uh, even though Vyron K1, I believe, can retro convert into K2, but um, at what rates, right? And then beta quarantine and vitamin A, like compared to like retinol. There's a lot of nuances in that. But anyway, the bit, the biggest thing here is like, how much healthier do you think you're going to be if you strive to get all the recommended vitamin and mineral intakes from food alone, first of all, okay? And then secondarily from like supplements if you don't think you can, okay? Here's another thing. Over our evolution, okay, how many hunter-gatherer people do you think actually like ate a diet that satisfies all vitamin and mineral needs. That is hilarious. That is hilarious. If you start to plug in the RDIs into an evolutionary context, I guarantee you the vast majority of human civilizations throughout the world over time hardly even reach 25% of the RDIs of vitamin and mineral intake. Um, Chances are the information I'm, I'm discussing here is very rare. It's probably not going to reach <laughs> the amount of people it needs to. 97% of human populations are operating from hilarious misinformation. <laughs> hilarious. It's hilarious to me how serious people take getting their RDIs every day. <laughs> Um, and then they think a little fucking like pharmaceutical grade multivitamin is going to like help them in any way, shape or form within their weird paradigm of needing to meet these needs set by a mainstream government with zero clinical evidence. Another thing like um, you. So what about the freaking omega three to omega six uh, ratio? Do you all realize the studies that were used to discover the, the omega three to omega six um, index? You realize it, it came out of uh, feeding tube studies. They basically, there were hospital patients actually where they found they were feeding them a solution of like um, exclusively soybean oil or something like that. And they, they found that they developed fatty acid deficiency type symptoms like patches on the skin and all the other things you read about uh, with the very specific kind of soybean oil they were using in their feeding tube. Okay. Cause you, they, these hospital patients were being fed like a, a mixture of like whey protein, isolate soybean oil and a cocktail of vitamins and minerals to keep them alive. And it was through a feeding tube. They weren't giving them real food. And they found that the isolated soybean oil byproduct that most people wouldn't be eating in that context. Right. It, it had a, it didn't have the right ratio. They need so when they added, I think I don't remember what it was. If it was just it was a different type of vegetable oil like canola or something, uh, and it had more omega three. They noticed that their symptoms went away completely, and so then that was the beginning, okay, of this whole like um, omega three to omega six ratio kind of thing. And I'm not saying that taking fish oil or or EPA or avoiding omega six. I'm not saying that um, this negates any benefit you might get from paying attention to that. But what I am saying is like this was, this is a reductionist mindset at play where people take these extreme contexts of like refined food epidemics, you know, with beriberi or feeding tube studies in a fucking hospital. And then they use that as like the beginning of their uh, building a, a theory or a hypothesis and gathering evidence to try to prove that hypothesis. You're starting already with an extreme condition that doesn't apply to free living humans. This is why I've abandoned talking about a lot of these reductionist concepts, even things like neuroepinephrine and catecholamine production and all these other things and the immune system and all this other crap. I, I keep it way more basic now because I recognize that most of science is not what people think it is. They think it's like the proving of facts and all this stuff. It's really the gathering of data and bits and pieces of evidence and things and trying to create a crystal clear picture over time with the data we have. But it's, it, I just think that the majority of it is very misleading when we take it away from like real world experience and the reality of how these things are supposed to play out and then how – People actually being healthy and stuff actually live, right? All right. So anyway, there's a lot more that we need to discuss about this. So 
Um, what is the other thing that I was going to kind of talk about here? Um, so, oh yeah. So here's the other thing. Um, most of the evidence. So now let's talk about the evidence surrounding vitamin and mineral supplementation. Okay. Listen, it is a fact that there are a lot of human beings, you know, that will show up at their doctor's office. They'll have deficiency symptoms and then their doc, you know, unfortunately, a lot of doctors don't actually test for nutrients, which is crazy. But the ones that do, who are actually intelligent and they're responsible and they're good practitioners, they will they'll get a, a panel and they'll recognize a deficiency and they'll find, hey, this woman has a folate deficiency or this one has a a, a calcium deficiency, which is actually usually a, a parathyroid issue or a vitamin D uh, issue or whatever. Or they have an overdose of this or that, right? And so um, there are ways you can diagnose nutrient deficiencies, okay? Um, and it happens. If you are diagnosed by a doctor as deficient in a, in a vitamin or a mineral or a nutrient, you better supplement. And this is the other thing is these people who are obsessed with like freaking vitamin and mineral deficiencies and optimal nutrition and stuff – when they have a deficiency rec that was diagnosed by their doctor, they refuse to take an isolated vitamin supplement. The whole reason those exist is because of clinically presented symptoms of deficiency that are, that are found and proven. If you have a deficiency, you are the only fucking person <laughs> that needs a supplement. Uh, it's crazy, man. This whole health community and nutrition community is crazy. Um, so anyway, the the only people who really need a deficient a, a a supplement is someone who is deficient. Okay, and and of course, so multivitamins and things. There's another population of people people who have had um, gastric bypass surgeries and. Um, you know, surgeries on their intestine and stuff like that. And, and, you know, unfortunately, a lot of these people could have, you know, done an elimination diet or something else and not needed the surgery to begin with. But there are certain surgeries and medications and things that can severely uh, destroy your body's ability or hinder your body or suppress your body's ability to metabolize nutrients, absorb nutrients, etc. And so in those populations of people where their uh, absorption and, and, and um, you know, metabolism and digestion is severely impaired, it is medically responsible and rational for these people to be supplementing with vitamins and mineral supplements, okay? But a normal person who hasn't had that, you know, surgeries on their intestine or whatever, they need to focus on eating their body weight, their ideal body weight in grams of protein from whole animal foods first. And then whatever kind of plant foods and other things they want to consume on, on top of that, provided they're not eating a lot of refined foods. Um, and I'm not telling people to eat only meat. I'm saying that should be the base of your diet. And the reason why I say that, you can, un you can understand if you really want to know, okay, people are quick to criticize me for this. Without reading the fucking books that I recommend, read the book Not by Bread Alone by Valdemar Stefanson because it clearly shows that as long as you eat enough animal flesh, you're not going to have any nutrient deficiencies or anything like that. And so that's why I say at a bait for your baseline nutrition, get your body weight in gram, your ideal body weight in grams of protein from whole animal foods. Read that book. Okay. They were in a metabolic ward for over a year after living with these populations of people who ate mostly meat and then being studied in a hospital setting. Um, I'm not telling people to just eat meat. I'm telling people that if you do eat that as your base of your pyramid and you get enough, that you're not going to present with, if you have nutrient deficiencies after that, there's something else going on. Okay. Um, this simplifies everything. It takes people out of this consumerism mindset that started with the brainwashing of America and the thinking that vitamin and mineral supplements are a panacea, are a, a, a elixir, are the cure-all. Okay. 
Remember, that came out of prof- profiting off of the, ec- the epidemic of vitamin deficiencies. And it's, it's brainwashed into us with cereals that claim that they're a good source of all the daily minerals and shit like that. <laughs> you know, and fucking Pop-Tarts, man, were marketed as health food and, and still are, I think. They're like a good source of iron and stuff. It's only a good source of that because they're fortified. But uh, anyway, so where was I going with that? Oh, yeah. So the studies do not show a benefit in taking a – like there's no – like so most of the research uh, – and what you have to understand it's epidemiological because that's the only way you can study it. You can't have a lifelong metabolic ward study or a lifelong uh, intervention trial. Okay, that's to study this shit. Um, but the major, like pretty much all of the, the good evidence we have, okay, for long-term health outcomes, when they, when they look at people who supplement with multivitamins, um, you, see, you see no clear, uh, no, not even a statistically significant uh, benefit. You don't even see a, 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 a significant relative risk reduction in diseases or all-cause mortality from, from multivitamins. In fact, you see a, a slight increase risk for certain cancers and other things in, in some of these studies, which again, it, it's, 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 a, it's a relative risk and clinical significance is not uh, or sorry, um, uh, statistical significance in these studies does not mean clinical significance. So there's not a huge difference, basically, is what you need to understand. Okay. <laughs> if these multivitamins were such a big deal, okay, we would see major differences or at least a, 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 um, statistically significant differences in relative risk reduction in the groups that ate, that took multivitamins, Okay. Um, you know, and you'll hear all sorts of weird rebuttals from people like, well, but we need to control for the types of vitamins they're doing. If they had a, a, a high enough quality multivitamin, it would be different and all this other crap. Um, the fact is it doesn't actually make sense when you think about all of these points in a, in a practical, real living context. It only makes sense from the reductionist, um, you know, test tube, rat study, um, you know, Dr. Berg and Dr. Mark Hyman and functional medicine, you know, sell you a bunch of fucking supplements and write like what, 50 books about uh, why supplementing with these things are, are important and all this other crap. Biohacking, all these people capitalize on it now. Make no mistake, alternative health practitioners, they are also pushing magic pills on top of nutrition and other things too, but they're still pushing magic pills. Okay. Uh, anyway, I'm not saying that you, that certain people might not get benefits from certain vitamins and minerals. What I'm saying is the vast majority of people would be like they have, there's bigger, more important things to focus on, which are the things that I now preach. I spent a whole decade obsessing over vitamin and mineral shit. I remember I used to go to the store and I've told this story before. So I used to spend, there was a period of time where I spent close to a thousand dollars a month on vitamin supplements and, and other supplements. And I hardly had enough fucking money for food, which is a, the biggest reason why I'm so passionate about this. And then after I was done with that phase, I went through like a vegan phase and whatnot um, and, and a plant-based phase and all this other crap. I went through a phase where I was eating meat, but also um, eating plants, and I, I, I was tracking everything in chronometer. I was spending like $30 a day trying to get all these different plants and the optimal sources for uh, vitamins and minerals. I remember spending all this money on Brazil nuts to get my selenium, which is hilarious. <laughs> um you know, pounds of greens a day for magnesium and, and, the, and the sweet potatoes and all this other crap. And only to find out that my health problems kept getting worse and worse. Okay. When I like back, like back in the day, I was eating all this spinach and all this uh, kale 
and all these other things, whole grains, black, uh, black rice, all this crap. And I had done various di different variations, tracking everything in chronometer. And I, I, I had so, I had several years, several years where I ate a hundred percent. I had over, because it's impossible to get just a hundred percent of everything over a hundred percent of my RDI of everything. Okay. From the optimal sources. Okay. Eat from plants and animals. And then also a year of just veganism where I was trying to do that shit. And, uh, I didn't feel any healthier. I felt way worse actually. Now I'm eating almost exclusively meat with a little bit of fruits here and there and then dairy and stuff and honey. And, um, and I, I don't even need organs as much as I used to, which is crazy. And then just taking some tonic herbs, like two, like actually right now, four tonic herbs, believe it or not. That's it. <laughs> okay. And I feel amazing now. And I know so many other people who have escaped that craziness, the nirvana of health, okay, who feel way better too, okay? And so, you know, people might hear me say, bro, just eat meat, fruit, tonic herbs, and organ meats, and forget all that other shit. <laughs> Keep it really simple, bro. Like vitamin supplements aren't, aren't really that useful or whatever. You probably don't need vitamin supplements. Just do this basic shit. People hear me say this and they think it's coming from a place of ignorance or mis or you know not enough information. People think, oh, nah, I'm going to listen to the science guy, right? The freaking uh, chiropractor that disguises himself as a doctor, supposedly, or even the, the legit MD or whatever. Um, and I'm going to follow his like top 10 vitamin supplement video. I must spend all this money on probiotic supplements and vitamin supplements and all this other crap that is not backed by any real causal evidence in the scientific literature. But I don't know how to interpret science. I just know that this crazy guy sounds legit and scientific and shit, and he has an MD on his name. <laughs> and uh, and sure, I'm not really. I mean, I think I'm feeling a little bit better. I'm definitely not feeling on cloud nine and like superhuman and stuff like Wolfgang always says he is. But Wolfgang, you know, it's too good to be true that I could just eat mostly meat and fruit and tonic herbs and feel amazing. Nah, nah, it's more, it's got to be way more complicated than that, right? Complicated problems require complicated uh, solutions, right? I got to eat all these plant foods and all this other crazy shit and spend all this money and all this crazy shit. Read all these books and keep, and keep reading this more and more complicated technical jargon right? <laughs> that all comes from rat studies and isolated lung, you know, test tube studies or whatever, and epidemiologic studies that have a very tiny magnitude of, of effect <laughs> or, or any clinical significant difference. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so there's even more to this, like antioxidant supplements, okay? Most of what you know, what you think you know about antioxidants is completely wrong. The majority of what your body uses to quench free radicals is endogenously produced. Glutathione, superoxide dismutase, even melatonin is actually a antioxidant. People don't know that. They think it's just a sleep hormone and they don't even know what it does. They think it induces sleep when in reality it just regulates sleep rhythms. Uh, uric acid. A lot of people don't know that uric acid is actually an antioxidant. They think uric acid causes kidney stones, uric acid causes gout, and all this other crap. It's a freaking antioxidant guy or woman or whoever I'm talking to. <laughs> and it's, it's produced endogenously inside of your body. But people, like, people don't even know about that. They don't know the, the real shit. They, all they know is like, oh, no, I heard that, you know, uh, cherries are a good source of melatonin or whatever. Or I heard that <laughs> oranges are a good source of uh, vitamin C and, and antioxidants. And I heard that, you know, eating chocolate or cacao is a good source of antioxidants. And green tea is a good source of antioxidants. Therefore, I should consume that. And, 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 and my best bet against chronic diseases and other things is to consume a lot of quote unquote antioxidants from green tea and all these other super foods, super duper foods, everybody. <laughs> but 
But then when you actually look at scientific research where they isolate these uh, so-called powerful super antioxidants from these foods, you do not fa- find clinically significant, clinically significant um, risk reduction in diseases over a long period of time. I will say intervention studies on things like ebicatechin gallate from green tea and like things like theobromine and some of these other kind of plant polyphenols and things from uh, cacao and whatnot, you might see a, a reduction in blood pressure and other things um, in the short term in intervention studies. Conversely, there's actually a study where they deprive people uh, completely, an intervention study. It was like a eight-week study. Completely removed all plant polyphenols from their diet in order to re-add um, actually green tea polyphenols afterwards. There's, a study exists. And they actually, and this was funded by a green tea supplement company, and they found that by removing all the plant polyphenols from the diet, it's, it's a washout period, they actually found that their antioxidant markers increased and their oxidative stress and damage markers decreased. Their inflammatory markers decreased just by removing all those plant polyphenols. So, and then when and then when they actually added the the green tea polyphenols in, um, they had seen like a short term increase in infl- inflammatory markers, and then over time a moderate decrease in in, in inflammatory markers, um, but only within the first three hours after consuming the polyphenol supplement. So anyway, again, I'm not telling people, I'm not trying to say that these polyphenols are bad, but I'm trying to explain that it is not as simple, okay? And remember, I, this is reductionism. Y'all want to get reductionist, but y'all only want to make claims about what you want to believe is true. You're like, oh, like, all, the, all these plant polyphenols are just like antioxidants, bro. <laughs> and they're just good for you, Right? Like it's so much more complicated than that. Y'all want to actually get complicated with it? You have to understand that it's so fucking complicated. It it's damn near impossible to actually fucking know what's going on there. Okay. Um, which is why just these days, I mean, I you I can talk about this shit and and, and vibe with it and extrapolate my kind of beliefs about the research, but it by itself is not. By itself, it's not useful, okay? So anyway, um, where was I going with this? Where I was going with this is that you don't need, okay, so, oh, these polyphenols, just so we can clear this up, they all have varying uh, effects in the body. The majority of them do not have direct antioxidant activity. The majority of them, especially green tea polyphenols and what else I say, cacao and all these other things, they are hormetic stressors and potentially have medicinal effects by themselves directly that lower blood pressure and do other things. Maybe anti-pain, anti-inflammatory, whatever. Okay, But they also come with their own side effects, being diuretics. Some of them might potentially you know, cause liver damage, supposedly, right? Um, and other things as well. Um, and some people speculate that, uh, polyphenols from curcumin or from, uh, turmeric, like, like the molecule curcumin, uh, might actually have the exact same side effects as a, a, a an anti-inflammatory drug itself. And at that point you're like, well, is this so-called natural compound really much safer or healthier than if we were just to take aspirin or something, right? <laughs> uh, anyway. All of this to say to, to basically make the point that um, when you are listening to this information, like, oh, um, you have depression, you have brain fog, low energy, you probably have all these vitamin deficiencies and crap. Look, I've made videos where I'm like, hey, the top five vitamin deficiencies or, or, or potential causes of um, low energy or whatever else, right? Um, but I don't tell people that you need to supplement with these nutrients or that you need to eat a certain food like liver in order to remedy this issue. What I usually say is you should probably go get a test to see if you're deficient in it. And if the test comes back and says you are deficient in it, guess what? 
you should supplement. And if you insist on getting it from natural sources, and get it from liver or wherever else, okay? Um, so anyway, if you have a nutrient, de- if you think you have nutrient deficiencies, you fucking test for it. Um, and so anyway, there's a lot of other angles I could hit it from, but <laughs> I have so many videos on this subject already, and I've been repeating this information for a long time, and I just feel like I don't know, man. Um, it's just, there's just so much information involved, and the all like. 99% of people in the health community, they're operating from this stupid idea that they have to reach all the RDIs and shit that the government set and have no real kind of like bearing on you as an individual. Um, so anyway, I don't know if I should give up, but it just bothers me so much, whatever, that I, you know, I don't know. It's important for me to get the shit out, but uh, <laughs> where is it going with that? Um, Yeah, so let's get some practical takeaways, everyone, okay? If you're eating a whole food diet and you base your fucking diet on whole animal proteins, and I recommend getting your ideal body weight in grams of whole animal protein per day, your ideal body weight, okay? If you're underweight, get your ideal body weight. If you're overweight, get your ideal body weight. An ideal can be what you think is good for you or what it or base it on BMI if you really, really want, right? Um, and just a little side note, BMI has nothing to do with actual health outcomes. It is a standard that is necessary for insurance companies to easily um, assess health risk so that they can get people insured and, and estimate the uh, insurance costs and shit like that. That's where BMI comes out of. But, uh, you know, whatever. Don't have to believe me on that. Body fat percentage and waist circumference is more important. uh, Is actually relevant. But, uh, yeah, eat your your ideal body weight in grams of animal protein. Okay, first and foremost. And then for things like vitamin C. Which, again, how did we find out about vitamin C deficiency? People are like, oh, you must get your vitamin C from, you know, and eat the oranges. How do you fucking not get scurvy if you eat only meat and no oranges or whatever? It's like, well, you know, it's because vitamin C deficiency requires a very specific context in order to be inflicted, just like the fucking beriberi and white rice situation. How do we find out about freaking vitamin C, uh, uh, scurvy or whatever? Sailors out there eating mostly um, saltine crackers that were probably moldy and then salt pork or whatever. They're, they're out at sea. They didn't have fresh food for, for, for so long, for long periods of time. And they are malnourished just in general. There are probably a lot more things going on with them than just like a lack of vitamin C. And they get to fresh land and they find like, what was it, like lemon juice or something like that. Or it, I guess it was lime juice technically. Uh, brought, you know, healed up their excorbate deficiency symptoms or whatever. <laughs> and now we use that crazy extreme context to tell us, oh, we need vitamin C every day. So, and, and obviously it's, it doesn't hurt anyone to just get an orange a day or whatever for your vitamin C or whatever it is, right? Like if that's what makes you feel optimal and that's what makes you ha- healthy, then cool. But these people who are like busting their ass to get enough money to eat enough meat at the very least, and then they're like buying all these supplements and they're reading, binging on all this information that is based on nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean? It really, that the biohacking people take it to a way extreme. People are like, I got to get all these different vitamins, and they have like tw- like thirty different supplements every day. If you understand all this shit that I'm talking about here. You realize, wow, that's crazy and unnecessary as hell. It's kind of, to me, it's funny. Because I was that person. I was that person for too long. Especially when I was vegan. When I was, The more vegan I was, the more supplements I took. It was crazy. Um, anyway. So, yeah. And I'm not saying, so please read information. Go ahead. Binge the biohacking information. That's cool. Do your experiments. That's how I got to where I am today. My whole YouTube channel, I have over a thousand videos now of just experiments and and research and all this other shit. Um, 
But one more thing that I'll say is, uh, yeah. So what I was like, I was saying, if you get that animal protein in, um, whole animal protein, okay, that's where the vitamins, and minerals are. If you're getting mostly whey protein in these isolated forms, it's just like the white rice thing, you know, at least from a philosophical standpoint. And then eat whatever plant foods and other things you feel like you need to fill in your gaps, you know? You don't have to be like me and go through periods of time where you're eating exclusively meat, organs, and, and, and fat, right? I mean, and for those people who think you need carbs, read this book. Oh, no, it's another book. Probably not going to read this book, right? You're just going to listen to Lane Norton and Dr. Mike Isretel. You know, and think that your body can't survive without dietary carbs, which is hilariously false. Hilarious. Again, the studies even on freaking VO2 max and 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 uh, what what is considered a glycolytic activity, needing dietary carbs and burning at certain intensities. Guess what? The context these studies were done were on carb adapted athletes, and then they take these studies that are two weeks long. Uh, and they deprive them of carbs after living their whole life adapted to a high carb diet, and suddenly they don't perform so well. And now that the, the takeaway from that study is uh, low carb diets ruin performance. Well, duh. If you are adapted for your whole life to eating a high carb diet, and then two weeks in you take those away, it takes like eight eight to sixteen weeks for your body to completely convert over to burning fat for fuel. So. You know, I'm not telling people to fucking eat keto, but I'm telling what I'm telling people is our understanding of carbohydrate metabolism, energy production, and nutrient metabolism is fucking wrong, like academically speaking, right? Mechanistically speaking. And it's crazy how fucking emotionally attached people get to like mechanistic jargon to the point where it now ruins them ruin it prevents them from seeing the actual facts about how all that mechanistic jargon might actually work uh it's just crazy the whole fucking thing is crazy so anyway anything that you need beyond freaking the basic diet let's say you have anxiety and depression and you're eating like all this freaking animal protein and organs and fruit like wolfgang's talking about and, you know, you just, your sleep isn't that good still or whatever. Usually it's because you need more salt. Okay. That's a whole nother video to make. I already made those videos, whatever. But the other thing is tonic herbs. Okay. Just one tonic herb for your specific purpose can completely change everything. If you're looking into biohacking because you want to improve your productivity and your focus, um, you know, you don't need a cocktail of supplements and all this other crazy shit. You can experiment with rhodiola. You can experiment with reishi, a uh, high-quality reishi. But, you know, people, they'll take a fucking low-quality bullshit brand off Amazon or from the store or something that that just is not potent and it, it's not the real thing or whatever. And then it doesn't work for them and they just assume, oh, it's bullshit. I need all these vitamins instead. Like, no. You just need, if you're going to take a tonic herb, take the top shelf stuff. Do it right. Uh, but yeah, for sleep, uh, anxiety relief, focus, you could take something like rhodiola, uh, reishi, holy basil. Holy fucking basil, my guy. My, my woman, my girl, whatever, is amazing for all those purposes. Or let's say that you're on the opposite side and you're someone who sleeps all the time, you, you, you're lazy, and you're doing the diet program that I talk about, and it, obviously it helped and stuff, but you're just lazy or, or you don't have energy or motivation or whatever, that get up and go, or maybe you sleep too much. Guess what? You could do what Coach Wolfgang's been doing lately, taking a six-year-old root, locally grown, Panax red ginseng. And blend that shit with, with some coffee in the morning or, or whatever, just hot water or whatever. That alone can all by itself can help you. But I prefer, I would recommend kind of combining it with synergistic herbs, but still something like cordyceps, something like, yeah, gynosima. Okay. Um, if you do the, the, the real stuff, like the big picture stuff, like I'm talking about here, none of that crazy shit that you're binge watching on YouTube, learning in nutrition courses or anything else 
will be of much benefit. It's like you get to a point where you're like, well, fuck. Look at all this information I'm missing out on, and literally I need none of it. <laughs> right? And it, and this is the hardest pill to swallow. It's like taking the red pill because then you notice, especially if you uh, are pursuing a, a degree in nutrition like I am, all your classmates and your professors and everybody else – they're operating from this crazy paradigm that doesn't match with reality. Um, and it's a very hard place to be. You're like, bro, I know the truth. It's much simpler. But uh, but anyway, yeah, I guess, you know, maybe I don't know everything, right? Maybe I'm, I'm probably I'm wrong, everyone. Maybe I'm wrong, right? Let me know in the comments why I'm fucking wrong, right? Let me know. Tell me I'm wrong. Anyway, if you like this video... Press the like button so I know people are watching and are enjoying this shit. Otherwise, I might I won't be as motivated to make all the, all these crazy long videos. Okay, um, my time is very valuable and and it's scarce these days. I'm very busy, but I love educating people. I need motherfuckers to press the like button and a comment down below and tell me uh you know if you even if you disagree, just let me know you're tuning in. Okay, and you're engaging with. Okay, comment down below. Talk to me. Goddamn it. Uh, whatever it is, even if it's a crazy troll comment, whatever, let me know. I don't care if it's good or bad or whatever. Just comment. I got to take a piece so bad right now. I'll talk to y'all next time.